Hi, Mary. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, Sarah. Good to be here. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. I am the parenting coach for the spicy ones, and that um, applies to the children as well as um, the adults that maybe don't fit uh, the typical uh, family or even what they had hoped they would be. So it's it's folks that um, are struggling and not finding it maybe as um, easy as it seems like it's supposed to be to parent. And often this is a mom whose mother was not able to parent in a positive and kind and sort of intentional way. And so they're making it up and they need a little support from folks like you and me. Yeah, I think we have very similar audiences and um, and communities. Um, one thing that uh, one one of my clients said, she said, "Why does it feel like everybody else is skipping through a field of daisies?" <laughs> and I, I think that's what it can feel like sometimes, right? When you have a spicy one and your friends or your sister in law doesn't, and it kind of can make you feel alone. Oh yeah, I mean, all it takes is one or two friends that also have a spicy one. And suddenly you're like, okay, okay. This parenting comes in many flavors, but if you're just looking at um, everybody's, you know, highlight reel on Instagram or um, at the little mild lemming children that are in the same location as you, it can really be maddening. Yeah, totally. So tell us, just define a spicy one for us. Okay, this is a kid who is looking to be autonomous and lead and is more loyal to their own soul than to what you think they need to do. And they're not afraid to take up space. They're um, louder than other children and their emotions are bigger and, um, and more intense. And they can have a zest for life and a passion and and that's contagious, but so is their despondency and complete meltdown. And so they have a real chokehold sometimes on the culture and mood of the house. They um, are hard to console physically, Uh, you know, where, where someone else says, yeah, do you need a hug? And that fixes everything. This kid is like, get the F away from me. Um, Like a caged, um, well, it's like you're approaching a wild animal in an alley is kind of the vibe. Um, you can't really rationalize with them. They're powerful negotiators, very comfortable with adults, right up to the point where they realize, oh, you're not going to um, give on this. And then they just lose all faculty. They notice everything um, that whether you've moved a chair or you're in a bad mood. So they're really perceptive. And um, they use really colorful language and bathroom words and tend to use toys, not in the way the manufacturer intended. It's just a lot, these spicy ones. <laughs> <laughs> they're also the best kids, though. I mean, they're, that's the, uh, I don't know, at least two, if not all three of my kids, I think, fit that that description, um, at least all three of them in some part, but they're also like never a dull moment. So I think that's I, I mean, one of my questions is like, what's great about them? But I think that's one of the things that's great about them. Yeah. Should we talk about what's great about them? Because- sure. Yeah. Well, before we do that, let me just ask you, do you see a difference between the label that people might be more familiar with, which is spirited? Do you see a difference between that label and spicy or uh, are they similar or, or the same? I think I'm picking up where, was it Mary Sheedy is that who came up with Spirited? Um, I think I'm picking up where she left off, but her vibe is, when you think of a spirited child, you, you think, I don't know if you're familiar with Waldorf or mm-hmm. um, like you said before we got on this call, like running through a field of um, daisies. And there's just a vibe to that that I don't think um, gives homage to the intensity, the fact that you get hit when that kid's upset. Um, so there's a lot of similarities, but I also think um, I, I'm moving into more naming the discomfort and the dissonance, as well as naming that a lot of what makes a spicy one a spicy one is who the parent is. And I don't even mean how they're parenting or anything they've done to cause this. I mean that you're expectations of a child, your need for control, your need for order, your um, ability to handle chaos and noise, your sensitivity really impacts whether or not you think you have a sensitive one. And I think 
the spirited child work, it was really primarily about just sort of looking at this child, but there's this um, family system happening here and your spicy one might not seem like a spicy one to me. That mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. It's like um, the environment has to do with it's like you take a particularly ki- particular kind of child, and in a different environment, it might not they might not be quite so spicy. Um, but as you said before, their sense of them their themselves and their own autonomy and their own integrity is in conflict with what's being expected of them, which is part of what makes them so spicy. You yeah. gotta respect that. I mean. <laughs> They are going to be such um, high integrity adults and the artists and the change makers and the revolutionaries and the activists, but who is exhausting to parent? <laughs> okay. Well, that's interesting because then I take it back a little bit that my kids are, are, were super spicy because there was, while they're super intense, there wasn't a ton of conflict, um, which is maybe it sounds like, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it sounds like some of it's conflict that is part of what is in the definition. Yes. And thank you. It, 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 when I have a great conversation like this, it helps me further understand wh- why I do what I do. Cause I know I'm a spicy one. I grew up that way. And um, I mean, even just the other day I was in a, a Pilates class and it was a really um, intense one. My daughter took me to who's 19. And I was like, oh, old women should not be in this class because it was like, it just was like CrossFit meets Pilates. That wasn't, it, I was freaking out internally. And the teacher kept saying, yes, you can. Okay. Now we're going to do this. Yes, you can. And I wanted to grab one of the weights and hurl them at her head because I'm a spicy one. And that, that direct, um, declaration of, of who you say I am or what I need to do just raises up the contrarian in me. And I think that's a part of being spicy too. And I don't, I don't know if it's part of being spirited. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, it's so fun. I, I don't want to, I feel like you and I could talk about this for an hour until we came down to like this pinpoint fine definition, which I don't know will serve. I don't know if that's going to, yeah, exactly. I don't know if that's going to serve our listeners because it's really like, there's nothing wrong with um, being strong-willed, which is a term I used a lot, which I use a lot, which I don't think is, um, is negative. Some people see it as negative, but there's nothing wrong with it until someone tries to boss you around. (laughs) Right? Like, so as, as long as you have autonomy and independence, um, and no one tries to tell you, yes, you can and and annoys the heck out of you, then yeah. I can, I can hear your listener going, well, hello, but the real world is somebody will be in charge of you. And this is where I say, yeah, your kid might have a tough time. Your kid might not be cut out for corporate America. They may have to become an entrepreneur like me. I was just going to say, only if you start your own business, then nobody will ever have to boss you around, which is like the two of us talking to each other. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so what's great about spicy kids? Oh my gosh. I mean, so much. First of all, they're they're truth tellers and they seem to pick up I think I have a book around here somewhere like the indigo child or the, there's almost a spiritual thing going on and that they're, they're noticing and aware of things that a typical kind of out to lunch unconscious person is not. And so they are, um, they're bringing in information to you that is like, Whoa, where'd you get that? I don't know. I just thought it right. Um, I think they're in tune with things like artists are, but also what's great about them separate from like how cool they are. I mean, if you can get with on the same program as them and let them lead occasionally and, and let them come up with unique ways of solving problems. Awesome. But what's also great is they send you hurling into a 19 year um, spiritual journey because you can't stay who you are most likely um, with your ego doing all the work um, and caring what other people think and having certain expectations for what good enough is or when you're worthy of love or you're a good parent if you do this, all that gets smashed to blitherines. Um, maybe it's smithereens. Anyway, um, it works. That, that to me is one of the the key um, values of uh, like the positives of having a spicy one is your life gets dumped out like a purse on the floor and you got to go through and decide what do you want to keep in it? What actually matters? What are your values? Yeah. I mean, when I'm coaching um, parents of kids like this, it's like you have to be very, very clear on 
ab, you know, saying yes to absolutely everything you can um, and really, you know, saying no to the only the things that are the most crucial or your life will just be so much harder, right? Yes. Yeah. And that, and then I would say the inverse about what other people's expectations are of you. Like you're going to have to learn to say, yeah, no, we're going to have to leave by five to get home in time for bedtime because you know that your next three days will be living hell, even though you are disappointing every family member. Oh gosh, can't you just be flexible? Sure. But I, my spicy one cannot yet, and it's not worth it to me. And so you will have to learn to set serious boundaries with people who you love and who love you, but don't understand and think that, can't you just tell them no? Uh, yeah, I want a hurricane to be let loose. It's not yeah. And, yeah. and it's an art. People are like, well, what do I do here? What do I do then? It is an art that no one can judge because only you know that that perfect le- edge of like your skis moment where it's like, I'm going to hold this boundary and they're going to be upset because I know I could cancel that thing we're going to go to. And I can ride out this storm and let this kid build some inner resilience versus another time when it's like, oh, I can see the storm brewing and I can't afford to be late to this situation. So I'm going to acquiesce. Like it's just a, it's a rhythmic, gorgeous, unique recipe that no one can, can dictate for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Just always being mindful of, of your energy levels, your child's energy levels, the situation, what's the most important thing um, in the, in the equation at the time. Yeah. So how did you come to do this work as a, I assume you probably weren't a coach before you had kids, coach of spicy ones? No, I was a marketing MBA businessy person. Um, and then I had kids and I had an angel baby and she was amazing. And everyone thought she was beautiful and stopped me on the street. And then around two, she began to say no to me. And she began to have these huge meltdowns about things like just get in your car seat. We've had a lovely um, ballet class. Let's let's go home now. Um, and I kind of came to the edge of my skill set, and I also found myself framing her as the enemy. And you know, I found myself on the phone once with a friend saying, "I can't stand her. Um, She's so bossy. She's so needy. She's so much. She sucks all the oxygen out of the room. And, you know, note to the reader, those were things that were said about me as a child by my own mother. So here I was um, re-solidifying a wound that had been passed down, I don't know how many generations. And so I then went on a, a whole stent to try to get her diagnosed with something. There must be something wrong with her if parenting her is this hard. And it took her to a um, play therapist finally. Um, and they were with her uh, one or two times and said, can you come next week? And I thought, oh good, let's figure out a game plan of how to deal with this sociopath. I'm, I'm in it. And then they said, can you come again? Can you come again? And for the next two years, I was the only one going to play therapy. <laughs> and there were no dolls. It was a bait and switch. Um, were they just trying to help you understand her better? Like what was no, their process? They were trying to help me get grounded mm-hmm. and um, unearth the wounding I had from misconceptions I believed about myself from my childhood and sort of working through my mother wound. Yeah. And um feel like, so that my inner voice wasn't like, what's wrong with you that you can't get control over her. Like I had just very harsh sabotaging inner critics. And so we worked on me getting grounded and firm. So the same behavior might happen. And I wasn't taking it personally. I wasn't adding to the charge by screaming or whatever. I became calmer. And then guess what? So did she, she's still a spicy one. But we have a beautiful relationship that would not have been possible if I had kept down the road of tell me what's wrong with her so I can feel better about this. Turns out she did not have a diagnosis. I mean, she's had her own mental health journey um, that I wouldn't share, but she's not on the spectrum. She doesn't have ADHD. Uh, I'm more neurodivergent than she is. Mm 
Mm. So I'm going to ask you a personal question and feel free to say you don't want to answer it. But how did your mother deal with you when you were little, do you think? I think it was, um, well, first off, there was drugs and alcohol in the home. So people were checked out a lot. And um, I'm sure that it was kind of an eye roll. Like, I love you, but I don't like you because this is too much, too dramatic, um, too sensitive. And so um, we, it really came to a head as a teenager. I was sneaking out. I was doing high-risk behavior. And um, so she dealt the best she could, but it, it was as adversaries, not we weren't on the same team. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How about you? Yeah. Um, I'd say that I had very similar, like I, I had this awareness when my oldest son was looking at high schools that we went to this open house, these open houses where they try to pitch you on, come to our high school. And they said, um, at this high school, we allow our students to be as big as they want to be. And I had this flash my entire life. I've been keeping myself small. Right. And I think, you know, as we do to get the love that we need when we're children, um, and, you know, I think that has re- that really consciously informed my parenting of not wanting to, my kids to feel like they had to keep themselves small. Um, and, you know, I think same sort of acting out as a teenager, but very secretly. Hi, mom, if you're listening to this. So she probably <laughs> she probably knows things that I did as a teenager, but, you know, sort of similar to you. Um, yeah, and I call that diet spice. They say, yes, ma'am, and you bet. And then they do as they please. In oh, front. that was me. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> like I was the I was the teenager who all of the other parents said, "Oh, if you're going out with Sarah, you can do whatever. You know, she's so good. You can." Little did they, little did they know. Um, okay, diet spice. Now I know it. Know what that is. Um, but yeah, I just think it's interesting. Like I just love that we've brought this conversation around to um, you know the the wounds that we experienced as we were growing up and how that informs our parenting um, and how that you were you were given this daughter who was very similar to you and a chance to do it a completely different way. Um, and how did that affect you in the process in terms of how you saw yourself as like, I mean, I assume that you also probably felt you were, you know, had to keep yourself small or else kind of thing like I felt, but did it change who you felt you were or had you already gotten past that? It was definitely a a life changing event to go through the healing of being the mom for her that I wanted to be Um, because you, in order to be, to speak kindly and to have patience with a child, you first have to speak kindly and have patience with yourself. And I had not had that up until then. I had a lot of judgment about um, mistakes I'd made and my worth. And so it has changed me. I'm just so gentle and tender with myself. And it's, I, I mess up all the time. My house is a disaster right now. And I just say things to myself like, that's okay. You're doing a great job. And, um, you know, you're worthy of so much love. You're, this doesn't define you. And so you can handle anything and you can really maintain your motivation, your inspiration when you have a, a kind inner voice, just like I can go learn how to kick a soccer ball right into a goal. If I have a coach, it's like, you've got this. I believe in you versus like, what is wrong with you? And I think so many parents especially ones with countercultural children are saying to themselves, what is wrong with you that you have a kid like this? What is wrong with you that you don't know what to do? Why don't you have any confidence? And we just, as humans, we don't make things happen when that's the feedback we're getting. So yeah, the change has been, I am more, um, I'm, I'm more self-compassionate, but I'm also more playful. I mean, kids just wake that up or, or they wake up your realization that you didn't play a lot as a kid and you don't know how to play. And, you know, we, we have all these decision trees in life. You can decide I don't play. I'm a parent that doesn't play, or you can figure out like, Hey, this might be a deficit in my whole life because you don't just play because it, and it gets kids feeling connected to you because that is their language. You play because that's one of the pleasures of life. And so I think I'm a lot more playful. I'm unapologetically playful now. And I wasn't in the past. Like even when I first started my um, parent uh, coaching business, and I don't do that anymore. I just have courses, a bunch of um, like on-demand courses. But 
I would think that there was a certain way I needed to be. And I would speak like this and I'd be like, I'm your parenting coach because I thought there was a way you had to be. And now I know that the way you have to be is unequivocally yourself because you listener are so unique from the other listener, uh, you know, a couple miles away. Like we are each just pieces of stardust and need to like really lean into our uniqueness without fear of what somebody else thinks. And I think I'm much more that way. And I will say that was parenting the spicy one, but it was also being an entrepreneur is like a, is like maturation on speed because if you care so much what other people think you can't do it because it's so cringy what I'm putting on the inst- on Instagram, but the person who I can help loves it. My friend. I, I love your Instagram. <laughs> Thank you. I do. No, I love it. I love it. And I've, I've um, like, like, frankly, I don't, I I'll ha- have to pick your brain at some point because I just don't know how you, I don't know how you do it. I don't you have a drama background. I do. And I'm in the groundlings improv school right now. Okay. Well, now I don't feel so bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not just like a regular human doing all these wonderful Instagram reels. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I love acting and I don't really have any places to do it. So I would like to do it more on Instagram, but um, I also need to, you know, count, I, I need, I want it to be useful to the person watching it. Not just. Oh, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen anything you've done that's been um, not useful. So I think you're doing a good job. So just back to how did you, um, so how did you, you talked about working on your own triggers um, of wanting to change your daughter um, and thinking that there was something wrong with her. How, is there anything else that, that sort of was a big aha in terms of getting through life with a spicy kid? Like, you know, you still have to get them yes. at the door um, in the morning, like, you know, that, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, two other things that I've done in my background that have helped me. One is nonviolent communication. Um, and that's sort of the whole thought about the words you choose kind of create a whole vision in someone's mind and they they create the space between you and the other person. So that has really helped. Um, and, and that's peppered in all my classes is kind of like, how do you want to phrase this in a way that leads somebody to want to be inspired to be with you and connects with you because parenting is leadership, right? You're just, um, you've just been assigned some really tough um, followers that want to co-lead with you. And then the the other thing is I'm a simplicity parenting um, counselor as well. And this is a, a book from, uh, it's probably 10 years old at this point that by Kim John Payne, it's the idea of just less is so much more when you're raising a child. And so less on the schedule, less um, stuff around because um, spicy ones can be visually overstimulated just as much as they can be auditorily or, or sense or touch. And so having less around is really been helpful and also less screens because when the spicy one comes off a screen, they're, they're not at their best generally. Yeah, that, that, that all, that all makes sense. Um, what so we sort of talked around this, um, but what do you think are the best ways that parents can support themselves when they have spicy kids? You talked about having good boundaries for expectations of the people around you um, in terms of what you know is best for your family. But are there other things that you have found helpful in your work or personally? Yes, um, in my mom's a spicy one's eight week course, I talk about rather than self care, we talk about self mothering. And so getting really clear, what are the things that I need to do on a daily and weekly basis to mother myself well, so that um, I am whole and, and cared for and can operate out of that place. You know, something as simple as participating in the loving of a snack being made. I remember the day I was making a peanut butter and jelly for my, you know, preschoolers and kindergartners to go, we're going to go to the park. And I thought to myself, well, I'll just eat whatever they don't. And then I had a kind of a, a God moment of like, wouldn't, aren't you worth also making a sandwich for? And I think that a lot of times we don't. So um, mothering ourselves and then remembering that like our greatest parenting tool is our body. Like this is, this temple of ours is 
the starting point of all the parenting tips and techniques. So what do we need to do to have it be at its tip top shape? Um, and I don't mean that like in an exercise way. I mean, like, what's it hungering for? What's it longing for? And even just staying aware that you have a body. So in a moment of conflict, pausing and checking in with your body and noticing somatically what's going on here. Oh, wow. My stomach's clenched. Oh, my, my, my wrists are bent and my hands are in a tight ball and my jaw is set. Why don't I take a moment, attune to my body and release those things, let some things melt. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm kind of in a different space now as I decide what I'm going to say to this person. So that checking with your body. And then of course the pause, like there are no, there are rarely emergencies in a parenting that feeling of your kid run, rushing into traffic, that swell of, of adrenaline, we bring that to things like, no, I'm not going to put my shoes on. Our body doesn't know the difference. And so really like pausing, slowing down to say like, this is not an emergency. I won't think about this. And in, in, in a year from now, I won't even remember this moment. So how about I, br I bring grace to it? So I don't know. Is that three? I think that's three things. Well, I, I lost count, but they're all all good things. Um, so, was there anything? I, I know we're we're starting to get close to the end of our time together. Was there anything that you really want parents to the parent my my parent listeners? Because I know that we really do have a very big overlap in those people who feel like they're failures because they're struggling, even if they're doing all the things that the parenting books are saying that they should do and their kid isn't reacting the way that the parenting book says that they should react. Was there anything that you really want people to know that I haven't asked you about? I think that I would say of all the things you think are your job as a parent, you know, feeding, sure, other things like low on the Maslow's hierarchy, like shelter, yes. Um, you know, cleanliness, those are things your child needs. But other than that, what's most important is that you find a way to delight in them because there's nobody else in this world who has been given to them to delight in them, to, to light up when they come home, to be excited to see them. And so if you're in a space where you aren't able to delight in them, that is a, it's like having an empty gauge on your car. Um, it's, it's important to get some support to join moms, the spicy ones, or get Sarah to coach you or do something so that you can find your way back to what I believe is your most important job, which is cultivating delight and high positive regard for this child, regardless, you know, unconditional high positive regard, regardless of how they behave, because the world won't have that for them. Yeah, love that. And we talk about delighting in your child a lot too. It's the I call it the the low hanging fruit. You might not be able to find the fifteen minutes a day to do special time every day, but you can find those micro moments of connection, or you can just really like you know let that love show on your face. Um, and and the last thing you said was actually was something I was going to bring up because I think so often out in the world our spicy kids get um, a lot of negative um, input you know, that, uh, the teachers calling their name a lot because they're not sitting still crisscross applesauce on the carpet or whatever. So they can, they can be out in the world and feel like bad kids because they're not, they're not towing the line the same way that other kids might be. So at home, it's even more important, right? That they feel loved and worthy for exactly who they are. Amen. Yeah. My last question for you, a uh, question I ask all my guests, if you could go back in time to your younger parent self, what advice would you give yourself? Hmm. I guess um, I would remind her to invest in her friendships with um, other moms, but also with folks that are on a different journey than her. And that a big part of your life is um, the quality of your relationships. And the children really are just home. I mean, depending on their capabilities, but about 19 years. And towards the end of that, they don't, they're busy. So really creating a life beyond your children. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Where's the best place to go for folks to find out more about you and what you do? 
maryvangeffen.com. All right. We'll link to it in the show notes. <laughs> and I, 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 uh, if no one, if people listening aren't following you yet on Instagram, I recommend they follow you over on Instagram because I, I just love your feed. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you.